ankles, we're going to talk really about ankles and how you treat ankle arthritis and the approach to that. And it's, uh, um, it's a topic that's evolved a lot, particularly over the last, uh, last 10 years. But I think there's certain basic principles uh, that apply. Um, Gloria, one thing I don't know is, oh, there we go. So, um, so the causes of ankle arthritis, when you think about the, the joints in the body that get uh, re joint replacements, you're talking about hips, knees, probably shoulders, then you fall into much smaller categories, which would be ankles, elbows, wrists, things like that. So, and part of, part of that reflects the who gets ankle arthritis. So a big group of post-traumatic, some, some young guy coming off his motorcycle, messing up his tibia like you can see over there and there's a little crack that goes into the ankle. That's not particularly bad to the ankle, but that's, a, that's one. Another is instability. People who have ankles that are very, very loose and they keep rolling them. They may not have pain, but they, they keep kind of rolling in the wrong direction and uh, they don't think they have too much of a problem because it just pops right back, but that can wear the ankle out over time, so that's another major cause. Then, of course, you get into uh, p individuals who have r rheumatoid arthritis is the most common, common example of uh, autoimmune-type diseases. Um, and as in all the lower extremity uh, arthritis, obesity plays a big role. Genetics, you can see some nice skinny person who has horrible hips, horrible knees. Well, there's probably some genetic predisposition that we don't understand. And then uh, other things like infection and so forth. And this is the point that I was making earlier, which feeds into the t talk later, why don't we do ankle replacements on everybody? So it's a, the, ankle, the prevalence of ankle arthritis is much less, uh, it's a much less common problem than hips and knees for some reason. The, the group, the cohort of patients who have uh, hip or knee arth uh, ankle arthritis compared to say hips and knees is a much younger group because they're, a lot of them are post-traumatic and, and post-instability. Um, if you look at these numbers, these are the numbers I, I could find and they're approximate what happened a few years ago, maybe in the last decade, and maybe Dr. Zanis and Kavanaugh and so forth can talk to this, but knee replacements supplanted hip replacements as being more common um, and there are a lot done in the U.S. You can see these numbers. Um, and the number of anchor replacements done in the U.S. is about 5,000. So, you know, if there are 50 states in the U.S., do the math, it's not, that, it's not that many. And it would be not uncommon for an average hip or knee replacement surgeon to be doing 100, 200 a year, some, some people more. So it feeds into experience issues. You can see the number of ankle fusions, about 20, probably about 25,000 in the, in the U.S., and those numbers will probably change. There'll be more ankle replacements than ankle fusions over time, but it's not a lot. So, you know, what is ankle arthritis? Whoops. Um, if you look at this x-ray over here, this, these are standing x-rays, which I always like to get, and you can see down in the joint over here, you may see a nice, smooth, symmetric joint. And on this side, the individual has a little bit of cartilage here, but it's worn out. Uh, on the inside here. That doesn't tell you how much pain the patient has. You know, I saw an 80-something year old guy the other day whose ankle looked absolutely horrendous. And I said, how are you feeling? He says, I feel fine. You know, I came in because my girlfriend sent me in. So, you know, it's, it's <laughs> I said, good for you. <laughs> um, again, who gets it? Younger population than hips and knees. That's, that's important. Why? Because a lot of the stuff, and maybe the other guys will talk about some of the problems we've had with metal on metal, ceramic hips, things like that, were all geared to what do you do about a young person, a 40-year-old who needs a hip replacement or knee replacement. In an, and so the principle is every man-made object you put into someone will wear out. And so if you're putting an ankle replacement into a 40-year-old, you are going to have a, a problem down the road. So is that the right decision? And we also know you really don't want to do a second joint replacement on someone if possible because there's a whole slew of risks that um, are much greater than a primary joint replacement. And that's stuff from hips and knees and obviously it'll be true for ankles as well. The other thing that I see commonly is people come in and they think they have ankle arthritis and there are other diagnoses because there's a lot of things that are close in the ankle. It's not necessarily obvious. So you can get subtalar arthritis, talar navicular joint. The talar navicular joint is a joint that everybody thinks is their ankle joint pain-wise, and it's not. 
other kinds of tendinopathies, loose bodies, uh, inflammatory disease such as gout is pretty common in the ankle. So you can see this in this particular individual, her ankle here looks pretty normal and her diagnosis actually is tailor navicular arthritis. When you put your finger on her quote unquote ankle, you think she has an ankle problem, but it, you know, if you've got to look carefully and you see that, and this is after we fused her tail and avicular joint, so wrong diagnosis there. So non-operative treatment would be uh, obviously modification of activities. Um, Anti-inflammatories, weight loss is critical. Um, you know, if you do the biomechanics, every pound you take off your belly, you're probably taking, uh, you know, three to ten pounds off your ankle. So I think that should be encouraging to patients and that and we, you'll see um, diminution of pain, which is what it's all about. Bracing and orthotics can have a valuable role. Shoe wear modifications like those MBTs, a uh, brand of shoes that's a rock -sol. It's an old-fashioned orthopedic trick, goes back probably 80 years. They can help people just in terms of the biomechanics. We talk, cortisone shots can sometimes be helpful, who knows why, but they do, they do help. <laughs> Visco supplementation, which we've talked about, which we talked about earlier. I've done it in the ankles uh, with all the caveats, and it helps somewhat. You're trying to buy time for these patients. It, it may help, it may not. The data I've seen is it doesn't help, but you know, we try it because we're up against the wall, we're up against a much bigger operation than a lot of these patients. And the role of physical therapy, I think, and strength is important. That's um, so you, you need you need to be strong str strong all around the ankle. These are the example of some bracing techniques. This, of course, these AFOs are basically an external fusion locks the joint up so that it doesn't move and may not cause pain. So to me, there are three main the three main options for treating ankle arthritis. If you're done and everything else in the list above fails, um, you can do an an arthroscopy in debridement. So if you look at this, uh, this individual, they've got some spurs here, and you can see that this joint, you know, there's a little bit of spacing in that joint. It's, it's better in the back than it is in the front. This is not as bad as this. So that it may be, maybe there's a different approach or a different recommendation for this individual than this patient. Ankle fusions, which have been around probably 80 to 100 years and are extremely effective, but have in terms of pain relief, but have their limitations. And then ankle replacements, which are kind of sexy and uh, coming in, come much, much more into the fore in the last 10 years, were tried 30, 40 years ago, failed, and now people have come back to considering them for a, for a certain group. So the goal with ankle arthrite, for the ankle arthros arthroscopic debridement is you, gotta, you cannot cure the arthritis. So a patient who has not that much arthritis, but maybe some spurs that are bothering them, um, sometimes you'll get lucky and you've got to be c careful and select those patients well and you're going to be wrong some of the time. And the, the goal is to buy some time and dim diminish the pain. In general, these are young people. If I have a 30-year-old guy, he had a bad ankle arthritis, has a spur in the front of the joint, I would say the arthritis is not that bad. I'd say, why don't we try to clean it out and make you feel a bit more comfortable. So here would be an individual. He had some spurring in the front of the joint. The back of the joint doesn't look so bad. And I went in arthroscopically and kind of just cleaned it out and burred this impinging lesion that gets pinched in the front there. Um, the, the thing I don't like about this is that sometimes in spite of all the best planning, sometimes they don't do well and you may end up going to the next step quicker than you'd like. So ankle arthritis, ankle fusion, that's really the gold standard for a pain relief. I think that there's some debate as to how, where it's a shifting plane. Um, it's not a normal. It's not a normal gait. For instance, if you if you fuse someone's subtalar joint, they have a pretty normal gait. But ankle, it's not normal. But on this sort of surface, you'd be hard pressed to know if someone had an ankle that was fused. In other words, they walk pretty normally on this surface. The big issues you worry about is if you if you've got a series of joints, you lock up one joint. There's going to be more stress above and below, so they will get arthritis in the in the joints around it, and. Um, but it's an extremely effective procedure in the right patient. Um, it can be done arthroscopically. I do probably most of them arthroscopically. If there's too much deformity, you can't correct it arthroscopically, but the, the patients seem to get better and it's less painful. You can do it outpatient arthroscopically. And the trick about ankle arthroscopy, you've got to be, as a surgeon, you've got to be very focused on the details 
making sure you get the ankle into the recommended positions and into the recommended position because that long term will be very important for those patients. And these things take a while to recover from, many, 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 many months. So here's a guy, he's a retired uh, police officer. He tried everything, this guy's tough guy, strong guy. And he'd had a, you could see this side is normal and he had this arthritic ankle here. We debrided him, we bought five years, 10 years on that. And I went in and uh, outpatient arthroscopically fused it. You can see the particular technique uh, with a couple of screws across the joint in their different techniques and this is his AP and lateral films and you know every time he sees me he hugs me because his pain is gone and he feels great but this joint here is not normal and I, I worry about this you know in the long in the long term he'll have he will have other problems long term um, but in the meantime he feels good here's another guy who's these and again these are young patients if you're talking about hips or knees a 44 year old Corrections officer, corrections officer, great guy, tried absolutely everything. You can see he's got a lot of deformity here. See how that ankle is very tilted and that joint is, com there's absolutely no joint space there. He is a little arthritic again and he's subtalar joint there. So that's a little concerning long term. So I did a different technique in this guy and put in a, this plate and screws, which made it extremely strong. And I did it open because I didn't think with that amount of deformity I could get him into the position that I wanted, um, which is the most important thing, is to make, you, there's no point in fusing someone in a bad position, you gotta get them into the right position. So less is more if you can do it right. So ankle replacements, which again is the newer, it's much a new technique than uh, hips and knees. It was tried in the 70s and a uh, lot, lot of failures and it was abandoned. And then there was a trend in the last 10, 15 years to go back to it. There's been a huge evolution in the prostheses over the last 10 years. Um, the initial prosthesis in the United States was abandoned. This was not abandoned in Europe, by the way, and the Europeans uh, have contributed a huge amount to this. Um, but anytime you see things change a lot in joint replacements, watch out because, you know, the hips and knees, for instance, haven't changed that much. That t that's a good thing. That means they basically got it figured out and they're changing things on the margins. If you see things being changed radically, that tells you they haven't figured it out. Um, it's technically very demanding. It'll, it'll wear out. And there are many more complications, at least historically, than with hips and knees. One of the big problems, for instance, with knees, the guys, other guys will talk about, the skin is right close to the joint. In the ankle, it's even worse if you get a wound breakdown and so forth you got a huge problem. But it is the appropriate thing for the right patient. And um, so he has a patient who's a low demand patient. So she's 70. She has a knee replacement on one side. She needs a knee on the other side. You can see that she's had a, an, a fusion of the great toe over here. And you can see she's arthritic over here and not over here. So she's low demand. She wants to walk without pain. She's not asking to play basketball run. And she's 70, she's not 40. So this patient ends up with uh, an ankle replacement um, done over here. And one of, the, one of the big problems, I actually sent her down to a friend of mine, um, I think this one was in Baltimore, because one of the problems is it's, it's hard to, to get, as a surgeon, enough volume that you're totally comfortable with this kind of a technique. And in, even in Metro New York, I don't know anybody who's doing more than I don't know, they'll all lie, but probably 20, uh, you know, 15, 20 a year. If you asked a hip guy, I'd do 15, 20 a year, that's nothing. So it's, you, you, it's hard to gain enough experience uh, with these to, be, to have absolutely predictable results without complications, and that's what we're asking for. And then there are a few other, pro other, issue, other ways to treat things. Uh, there's ankle joint distraction where you put on an external fixator and try to stretch out the ankle with the hope that that'll do something. There are a couple of guys who, who tout that. Most people are, think the cure is worse than disease with that, kind of a, with that kind of a treatment, but it may be appropriate in a small population of patients. Osteotomy, straightening things out, and then much bigger fusions for patients who have more complex problems. Thank you very much.